Okay, so this week we start talking about something called data structures. And data structures are just ways to organize data so you can pass it around as a group, so you can treat it as a group. Now, Python has two main data structures. It comes with two data structures, and those data structures are lists and dictionaries. Um, and there are some main differences between a list and a dictionary. A list is order, mutable, and has an index. And we'll, we will go into all of those in just a few minutes. A dictionary is unordered, it's mutable, and it maps keys to values. It does not have an index. Both of these are means to organizing your data. Right now we've dealt with small amounts of data. As we move into our project, we are now going to have much bigger amounts of data. And we want to treat those as, um, as groups of information. And the way we do that, the way I do that in my work life is I create structures for my data. Um, and in Python, you don't really have to worry about that because they give you the two basic structures. So we have a few new symbols we're going to be dealing with. The first is the open and close square bracket. Now, an open and close square bracket is indicative of a list. And um, that is an indication to Python whether it's open and close square brackets with nothing in them or with stuff in them that Python's about to deal with a collection that is a list. Um, the other one is the open and close curly braces. Now open and close curly braces are an indication to Python that it is about to deal with a dictionary. So Python knows based on the symbols that we are using to surround our data whether it's supposed to act as a list or as a dictionary. Okay, we've talked about CRUD a little bit before, create, read, update, and delete. We're going to talk a little bit about a little bit more about it today. So create is when you're instantiating a new list or dictionary. Um, in this case, list, sorry. Read is we're just getting data out of that list. Update is we're modifying an existing list and delete is that we're completely removing the list. So lists are ordered and mutable. And those are the two things you really have to think about when you're dealing with lists. Now, what does mutable mean? Mutable, mutable means you can change it. Strings, although we talk about strings as if they're lists, they kind of are, with the exception that strings are not mutable. You can't pull out you know, the S in stop and put in an extra T. You have to create a whole new string. With lists, because they are mutable, you don't have to do that. You just pull one thing out and replace it with something else or just pull something out. You don't have to create a whole new data structure just to change an element in it. So this is my little CRUD uh, diagram. So you create by creating an empty list. An empty list is just the opening, close, square brackets. And I create an empty list by assigning it to a variable. So when we look at this, we look at my underscore list, we know that my list is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. We're, we, we've been doing that for weeks. We all get that. Now, usually on the right-hand side, you have a string, an integer, or a float, or a function call like input. But here we have this open and close square bracket. So this is telling Python that I'm creating an empty list. Nothing going to put in that list just yet, but I want a placeholder so I can just drop information in. You can also create a populated list. In, and it's the same thing. We still have our variable. 
It's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And in this case, on the right-hand side, we have an open square bracket. We have Lisa 42 and 3.14, and then a closed square bracket. Now, the other thing to notice here is that lists can have any type that you want in them. It doesn't have to be just a list of strings or a list of integers, or a list of floats, or a list of booleans, you can mix it up as much as you want, including having lists inside of lists, which we're going to look at a little later, dictionaries inside of lists, lists inside of dictionaries. You can create this stuff in so many different ways. So read. Read means I'm getting at data in the list. Now, we've seen how to get at data occasionally. We also saw, you know, with strings, how every single letter in a string has a related index value. Well, a string is just a special kind of a list. So the same thing happens with other lists. Everything in a list has an index number, starting at 0, going to 1 minus the length. So to get to it, I use the variable that I assigned the list to, and I open a square bracket. I put in the index of the element that I want, and I close the square bracket. And that's how I get to data in a list. The other way to do it is to access it in a loop. Now, this is, uh, this is one of my favorite ways of accessing data. I can have a for loop, and I don't have to do anything special. All I have to do is say for, give it a variable name. In this case, it's elum, and there's nothing special about elum. It's just a variable name. In my list, for and in are made to work on ranges. And a list is, in fact, a range, okay, because it has that index value. So I can just roll through a list with those two lines of code and print out anything I want from the list. Update. You can change the value of any element in the list. So here I have my list, open square bracket, the number two, close square bracket. So if I look at my list from the create, I have three elements. And what I'm doing here is I am treating the element in the list, that, so the, this place in the list that is 0, 1, and 2, so it would be the last element in the list, as its own variable. And I'm just assigning to it. And what that will do is it will simply remove the old value and add a new one. I can also append to a list. If I want to add more stuff to a list, the way I do that is by using the dot append function. Now you'll notice that what I have is I have the variable my list. My list was created as a list, so Python already knows it was a list. So if you look under create, you either have my underscore list equals the empty brackets, or you have my under list equals a populated list. And so because Python knows it's a list, I can just use the variable name my list, call a function called append, and then give it a piece of, give it a value and it will change the list. We can also pop because sometimes you want to remove things from a list. So you can remove a list, by, move things from a list by popping them off the top. And there are actually a whole load of other functions you can do on lists. So down here on the bottom of the slide, there is a URL to data structures from the Python document site. And it gives you a comprehensive list of all the things you can do. Delete, I want to remove a list. Or I want to remove an element from a list. So there is a new keyword. The keyword is DEL. That stands for delete. And I want to delete the, set, the third element or the element at index 2 from my list. I'm going to just say del, my underscore list, open square bracket, the index number, close square bracket. 
or I want to get rid of the whole thing. So I just say Dell My List. So that's kind of the handy dandy create, read, update, and delete chart. And it's kind of, it can be used as a little cheat sheet to come back to. So let's look at challenge 611. And we're going to modify short names by deleting the first element and changing the last element to Joe. So your handy dandy professor has typed in Gertrude, Sam, Ann, and Joseph. Okay, so now I'm going to split that by comma, and I get a list. So we've already, we already know that when we split a string by either a space or um, a letter, I'm going to get a populated list. So my variable names now has a list of four elements. So the first thing I want to do is I want to get rid of the first element. So we know how to get rid of an element by using the DEL keyword. And what that provides me for is Sam, Ann, and Joseph, because I've gotten rid of Gertrude. So now I want to update. So I've created, I've deleted, and now I'm updating on this line. I want to change Joseph to Joe. So I do that by names, open square bracket, the number two, close square brackets. So I have zero, one, and two, and I go from Joseph to Joe. Okay, list methods. So there's so much more we can talk about about list methods. I've put the URL again here. Some notable list methods are count, sort, append, and reverse. Now, why am I saying these are notable list methods? They're notable because you're going to need them in labs this week. So um, if you're wondering about how to do something in a list or a dictionary, go to that URL and see if they've already figured it out for you. There are so many list functions. So you can count the number of items in a list. You can sort a list. You can append an element to a list. And you can reverse sort a list. So, and those are just a very small fraction of what you can do. So again, you're going to need these in labs this week. OK. So before we go there, let's just go out and take a little bit of a look at um, some code. This is just a simple list, and I just wanted to demonstrate some, some things about a list and, and how it can be changed. So this is just a really simple function, and again, it will be up on YouTube um, under the links in the description, as will all of these. So I have an empty list. I'm going to populate, I'm going to create a simple list. I'm going to do some printing to show you how it prints. I'm going to show you how to get the element and the index. Um, so let's just go through and look at some of these. So I'm going to debug this. And you know my, my handy dandy debugger is my friend. So when I'm looking here under special variables, I want you to see what happens. OK, what PyCharm gives me? Let's see if I can go and make that bigger. I still can't make that bigger. What PyCharm gives me is that I have a variable called empty. That variable is a list, and its length is 0. That's what PyCharm just told me. OK, and you can also do that here by just mousing over. So PyCharm will tell you what you have, not just that it's an int or a string or a float, it will tell you if it's a list. It will tell you if it's a dictionary. And this comes in very handy when you are knee deep in your room's dictionary or your inventory list. Um, Py the Python debugger is your friend. So I'm going to step over. So here in the console, I print it empty. So when I print an empty list, that's what I get. I get the open and close square bracket. Now I'm defining a list called simple. So here I have simple is list. It has four elements, and those are the elements in the list. And when I print it, again, I get 
pretty much what I put here, okay? It's an open square bracket, all the different elements, and a closed square bracket. But that's not always what I want to do. Sometimes I want to print out the data in the list. So if I step over, I can now print out each item in the list. And what you'll see is I have four items. Item is just a variable name. There's nothing special about it. In simple. So that's all I have to do. And in two lines, I can run through a list of any length and print out the value of it because I'm using a for loop with the in operator. So now, maybe I want to print it out a little different. Maybe I want to print it out so it looks a little better formatted. And I want to do that because I want to give it the counter and the value. And also, while I'm in here, I may want to change something. So here I have um, if simple of counter is the value 29, I want to change it to 39. So let me also go through and show you how to read this because I realize I haven't yet. When I am looking at this if statement, I am saying I have a variable called simple. I know it's a variable because before I had to define it and I defined it as a list. I want to get from simple the value at whatever the counter is. Counter is just a variable. It comes from here. This is counter and this is counter. And I want to get whatever is at that counter. And then in line 15, I'm saying, if it equals 29, I'm going to correct it. She's not really 29, she's 39. And then I'm going to print it out. So let's go through and take a look at this. So I am in, I'm, a, I'm inside the for loop, counter is zero. I am going to go and I'm going to print simple of zero is Lisa, and that's how you read it, of. And so then I'm going to, I'm up at the top of the loop. I'm going to print simple of one is 29. Now I want to change that. So I am now going to enter the local scope for this if statement, and I'm going to change 29 to 39. Now, you'll see up here, because PyCharm does these things for you, that even though this was defined as 29, I've changed it to 39. And I'm going to hit this print statement. That print statement is symbol of 1 is now 39. And now I'm going to do simple of 2, which is 10, and simple of 3, which is true. And then I'm going to print simple, which shows you that 39 was actually replaced. And now I'm going to add, just added to the list, to my simple list. I'm going to print it again. And now I have the same list, but I have appended to it. So that's kind of my CRUD example, create, read, update, and delete. Okay, so let's talk about sort and reverse. So for 6.21, sort the names in reverse alphabetical order. Remember those functions I told you you were going to have to use? Well, this is how you use them. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to input Jan, Sam, Ann, Joe, and Todd. I'm going to use my split function to change those into a list, five element list. And now I want to sort them. Sort means I'm going to sort them alphabetically. So here I am, I've sorted them alphabetically. That's all I had to do to sort them alphabetically was use that Python provided function. If I want to reverse sort, all I have to do is say dot reverse and it's going to reverse the order and it's and that now my order of my list is in reverse alphabetical order. And I'm done. So let's go back for a second. So that's all you had to do. When you start hearing about sorting and reversing and things like that, what you need to do is go look up how to reverse sort in Python. 
And if they're giving you this huge, long, complex answer, look again because this is all you have to do. It's just a couple lines of code. The reason I'm kind of spending a few more seconds on this is because I have seen more students get caught up in how to sort. They write complex loops when they don't have to. If you're out there programming, if you're out there and you're writing your program, go out and see what Python already gives you in terms of functions you can use. It's completely acceptable. You're not doing anything wrong, and it will save you time and aggravation. So loops and lists. Um, four loops were made for lists. So on 6.3.3, we'll write a loop to print all elements in hourly temperature, separate elements with a basically a little arrow, a dash, and um, a greater than surrounded by spaces. So. We're going to get our user input again. That's my input, 90, 92, 94, and 95. I'm going to split. There's a pattern here. You should understand the pattern. When you go looking for, uh, when you start looking at your labs, because they're probably going to tell you that you're going to enter a string into an input statement, and you're going to have to turn it into a list. How you turn it into a list is using the split function. So now I have a for loop. For loops and lists are made for each other. You don't need to use a while loop when you're dealing with a list. You only need to use a for loop. Or at least there are very few times in my life where I have ever seen that you have to use a for loop, or sorry, a while loop with a list. So my for loop is for index in range len hourly temp. So basically what I want to do is I want to look at every element in the hourly range. Now, just a quick reminder, index numbers start at zero, just like they did with strings. So you don't ever want to go straight to the length. You want to always go length minus one. But range is already taking off that minus one. So I can say range of len hourly temp. Len is just a function and it gives us the length of a list, the number of elements. So then, so there's my in, my for and in. So I'm going to print the hourly temp uh, index and I'm going to end it with a space because I don't want to have a new line. Print function normally has a new line. You can end it with something else. And then I'm going to say if index is not equal to the length of hourly temp minus 1, then I'm going to print my arrow and end with a 0. And there goes my little animation. So 90 was pulled in. I printed it out. Um, it was not the last element of the list, so I printed out an arrow. So now I'm at index 1. I'm printing out 92, and I'm printing an arrow. Now I'm at index 2. I'm printing 94, and it's not the last element, so I'm printing an arrow. Now we're at index 3. I'm going to print 95. And I'm done. There is no more in there, so I will not print any more. So that's how you handle something that this is, this is similar to one of your labs. Now I'm going to keep going, and then we can go back later if we have more time to do um, some more looking at code, because we still have dictionaries to go through. So the in operator will evaluate each element in a list in order. So multidimensional lists. So everything we've done so far is flat. You know, it's just one long string of things in a list. Well, that's only a very small thing about a small amount of what lists can do. 
lists can hold other lists. They can hold dictionaries. Lists can hold lots of things. So um, what we want is we want to understand how to do a multi-dimensional list. Now, if any of you have ever used a excuse me, please. If any of you have ever used a spreadsheet, you've used a multi-dimensional list. A multi-dimensional list is just a matrix, rows and columns. That's all it is. And it's very, very, if, if you're dealing with complex data structures, um, it's very important to understand how they work from a looping perspective, especially. So if I have this um, multi-dimensional list, I'm going to have loops inside of a loop. So what I have is each one of these lines in here, each one of those rows in the matrix represents its own list. So the first row is 10, 20, 30. That represents a list of 10, 20, 30. The second row, where'd it go? The second, oh, I'm sorry. And it's separate because you're dealing with multidimensional lists. Each list is considered its own element in the parent or the outer list. So you have to separate each individual list from each row with comma. Okay, so the next row or list this is going to be 40, 50, 60. We're going to do a comma again. And then we're going to have 70, 80, 90. So here's a couple of important things. You're going to have an outer loop list and an inner list in a two-dimensional list. The outer list always starts with open and close square brackets. Each inner list is going to start with its own open and closed square brackets. And the brackets have to be balanced. If they're not balanced, and I'll show you what, you'll, you'll, you'll see that there's a syntax error if they're not balanced. So if we look at challenge 6.5.1, we're going to print the two-dimensional list, multi, multi, I think it's multi-table by row and column. We're going to use nested loops here. So how does a nested loop work? A nested, so for every dimension you have in a list, you are going to want to have its own loop. So if I have an outer and an inner, if I have, if I have a two-dimensional list, sorry, you have your main outer list and then some number of lists in the inner list, I'm going to have nested for loops. So what's happening here so far? So for 6.5.1, I've entered 1, 2, 3, 2, 4, 6, and 3, 6, 9. It's just my user input. So what in the world am I going to do, and how am I going to split this into a multidimensional list? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is split it into a, a single dimensional list. Okay? So I'm just going to use split function. I'm going to split it on the comma. And now I'm going to have three elements in a single list. One, two, three as a string, two, four, six as a string, and three, six, nine as a string. So now I want to take this stuff and I want to put it into a table. So how am I going to do that? Well, I know from the way I typed it in that we have that those strings that I've created have spaces. So I can split it again. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do a for loop over my rows. And for each element, I'm, well, I'm going to split it. So row of counter dot split is going to split it into its own list. And then I'm creating an empty um, list called row. And now I'm going to put each element, each cell, into the row. I'm going to append it. So I am creating a row. And now I'm going to append this to my table because I'm st still trying to create my multidimensional list. So then I go up 
and I'm going to go look at the second set of elements. I'm going to do 2, 4, 6, and then I'm going to do 3, 6, 9. So that's how I'm creating those lists. And when I print it out, I can simply print it out with a uh, bar in between them. Sorry, my animation's off on this one. So we're going to do the nested for loop is for when we want to create the output table. I'm sorry, there's two nested for loops. When we're populating the table and then when we're printing out elements from the table. Um, dictionaries, what time is it? Whoops, I was doing that to me all night. So let's go through dictionaries and then we'll go back and we'll run some examples. Just because the last time I did this last semester, I didn't get quite through everything I wanted to. So dictionaries are what's called an associative container. I am associating a key value pair. There is no concept of an index in a dictionary. Um, it is unordered. Because there's no index, there is no order. And that's a concept that sometimes is harder for students new to dictionaries to understand. But that's because of the associative nature. That's because we have a key and a value. I like dictionaries because dictionaries allow, allows you to associate meaning with a value. That's something that there's no way to do in lists. So um, how do I know it's a dictionary? Curly brackets. So a, diction a dictionary is a collection of key value pairs. So a key is on the left-hand side of a colon, and a value is always on the right-hand side of a colon. That's why it's called a key-value pair. Um, and the format is very specific. You're going to have a key, the colon, and a value. Then you're going to have a comma, another key, colon, and a value, another comma, and you, so on and so on. So if I look at this line here, I have my underscore dict equal. So I know that my underscore dict is a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign, I am assigning a dictionary. That dictionary has three elements. The first, el the first key value pair or member is name Lisa. So I've just associated the word name with the value Lisa. And so I've given Lisa meaning. Age is 42. Now what could have that been? Well, it could have been what's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. But instead, age is 42. That was just a hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy in case anybody recognized it. But anyway, and the amount is 3.14. So there's no index. It's just key value, key value, key value until you don't need that anymore. So here's just a little graphic. The key here is name. The value is Lisa. The key is age. The value is 42. The key is amount. The value is 3.14. So crud for a dictionary. Just like we had crud for a list, we've got crud for a dictionary. To create a dictionary, there are two ways to create a dictionary. You can create an empty dictionary, you just open and close brackets. You can create a populated dictionary by adding the key value pairs. Read it. How do I get information out of something without an index value? Well, you use the key in replace of the index value. Now, here is something to note when you're dealing with dictionaries. I've said, you know, we know it's a dictionary because it's a curly brace, and that's correct. When I am accessing information inside of a dictionary, I use the square brackets around the key. So I don't use curly brackets here. 
I use square bracket. So you'll see my underscore dick open left square bracket, the key close right square bracket. So that's something that can trip up students originally because they think a list is square brackets. And when you're defining them, a list is definitely square brackets. When you're accessing, when you're reading information from a list or a dictionary, you do use the square brackets. Update. Well, I can just change the name to Fred. All I'm doing is replacing a value associated with a key. I can append to a dictionary by using the append function. When I say append, it will I will have to give it the key. And that will be on the left-hand side. And then I will have to tell it what the value is. So dictionaries are a little different. So delete, I can delete a dictionary. I can remove a whole dictionary. So iterating over a dictionary, if it's a key value pair and I don't have any form of index, how do I iterate over a dictionary? Here's how you iterate over a dictionary. So I'm going to input and um, I have this string, C colon 136 comma I colon 124, blah, 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 looks suspiciously like it could be made into a dictionary. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to split this into a list. And you're like, well, but are we supposed to be iterating over a dictionary? Yeah, we are. And we will be. But first of all, we have to create the dictionary from the user input. And remember, all user input into Python is considered a string unless you tell it differently, like it's an integer or a float. But there is no function like int or float to convert it to a dictionary. So we have to do that as programmers. So we have to take this string and break it down piecemeal. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to split this by comma into individual elements in a list because that's something I can handle. I can deal with elements in a list. I know how to loop over elements in a list. So I'm going to create country pop as a variable. That variable is an empty dictionary because I've just given it the open and close parentheses. So now I'm going to do four pair in entries. So I am using a for loop to um, look to go through my entries list and I'm going to do something with it. So the first thing I'm going to do is I have my pair. Pair is in the first case is going to be like C136. And I'm going to split that based on the colon because I can split it based on any character. And I'm going to split it based on the colon. And what that is going to do is it's going to give me another list. That list is going to be C and then 136. Okay. So now I want to add something to my country pop dictionary. So I'm going to say country pop of split underscore pair of zero equals split, split underscore pair of one. I've just added something to my dictionary. And so now I'm going to do it again. I'm going to split the next pair, which is I and 124. I'm going to then add it to my dictionary. I'm going to do it again with US and 318. And I'm going to do it one last time for 0 and 252. And I will come out with that dictionary. OK, that's fine. But I haven't iterated over a dictionary yet. I've only iterated over a list. So how do I iterate over a dictionary? The second part of this problem is how you iterate over a dictionary. So I have another for loop. But this is a little different. Because now I have for country comma pop in country pop dot items. That's completely new. I know what a for loop does. 
I know what an in does, but what about this country comma pop and pop dot items? So Python has the ability to iterate over a dictionary by allowing you to create a key and a value element separated by a comma in the for loop and then it's got a function called items which works on a dictionary to get you both the key and the value. So here's what happens. When I go through my dictionary and I've got country pop dot item, the first item it's going to get is C colon 136. And it's going to take C colon 136 and it's going to put them into individual variables. So country will become C and pop will become 136. So that's what that line does. So I'm going to print out country has pop people. And the items will return the key value pair. The key value pair, and it always is key then value when it comes from items. So that's the order. And, whoops, my bad. Here. Sorry about that. So every time I run through this, I don't know why I didn't do that in this. My bad. Okay, so every time I run through this, I'm going to get the country and then the population. So I will get, the first time through, I will get C for country and 136 for pop, and then I'll print it out. And then the second time through the loop, I'll get I, and I'll get 124. So country will be I, and pop will be 124, and so on for the other two. I need to make sure I finish that. Okay, so dictionary values can be anything other, even another dictionary. So. I have, this is a nested dictionary, and this looks suspiciously like I'm creating a set of rooms for maybe a game. So this would be a good thing to understand for your game. So we have, I have a dictionary called rooms. I know it's a dictionary because it is um, on the left hand, sorry, I know it's a variable it's on the left hand side of a single equal sign. I now have these this dictionary that actually contains other dictionaries. So if I read this, I see a key of room space one in quotes, it's just a string. So that's my key. My value to the right hand side of the colon is another dictionary. And that other dictionary has south. In this case, that's a direction, and room two, which is another room, and north, room three, which is another room. And then I have room two, and I have north, room one, and room three, another dictionary, south, room one. So this is similar to what you're going to need for your game. Your game is going to need more than three rooms. It's going to need eight rooms. And you're going to need to use this to map. Everywhere you put a directional arrow in your Module 5 assignment, you're going to need an entry in your dictionary. So if you're going, uh, by the way, we just got a lot of lightning. I'm hoping the Internet doesn't go out. So if I just happen to go away, that's the problem. Um, so if you have eight rooms and you have rooms going north, south, east, and west, every single one of those arrows has to have an entry in the dictionary somewhere. And they will be, a, the, the dictionary will be populated based on the room that um, is the initial value. So room one is the initial value, so can I go to, how do I get to room two? I go south to get to room two. How do I go to room three? Well, I go north to go to room three. So it is from the perspective of the room that you're talking about. So if I'm thinking about room two, what can I do in room two? Well, I can go north to room one. And we will go over this. Okay, 
I'm going to go through the lab, and then I think I have in this, I think I have the example of how the dictionary works when you have a, a, a nested dictionary. So, um, lab 6.12 basically looks a lot like some of those challenges we did. The user is going to input a value, and we're going to split that user input string into tokens. Okay, so those tokens, actually, let me go read the actual thing. Okay, so this is 6.12. So what 6.12 is doing is um, basically what you're writing a program to take any number of integers as input and output the average and the max. So I'm getting a string, a single string. That single string is integers separated by spaces. So what do we do when we have that? What we do is we do what we did in the challenges. The user's going to input it. We're going to split it based on a space, which means we don't need anything in the split function. So now what I have to do, I have to create an empty list, and we've seen that in challenge before, and then for each token in the, li the list that came from the user input, I need to convert it to an integer and append it to my new list called input data. And then I need to get the average and the max. So the average is going to be the sum of the input data divided by the length of the input data. And the max is going to be the max number of the input data. Now, I'm pretty sure that you don't have to write special loops for those. I'm pretty sure that there's a max function out there somewhere for a list. And there's probably a sum function out there for a list. So, and that's what the little thing says, built-in functions that iterate over lists. So don't write your own iteration. Go out and look for the functions that already do that, that Python gives you. Okay, so 6.13 is filter and sort. We already talked a little bit about sort, but basically you're going to get a list of integers. Um, non, you want, you're going to get a list of integers. They might have positive, and they might have negative numbers. You're going to output non-negative integers in ascending order, lowest to highest. So that would be a sort. So I have to do two things here. I have to skip over the negatives and I have to sort a list once I've gotten rid of all the negatives. So the pattern is the same. We're going to get user input that's a string. We're going to split that string. Then we're going to create a, an empty list because I need an empty list outside the loop so I can put my data in there. So now I'm going to go through that list of strings. I'm going to convert it to an integer. I'm going to decide if the token is greater than zero. If it is, I'm going to append it to input data. So after I'm all done and I have only positive values in the input data list, I'm going to sort it. That's all I have to do. I just have to use the sort function. Um, and then I want to simply output the values in the order that they were sorted. So that's just basic output with a for loop. So 6.18, word frequency. This one seems to... Um, trip up some students. Um, but this is basically where you want to use the count function. So you're going to get some input from Zybooks, and it's just going to be a bunch of words and their frequency. So it's just going to be 
a bunch of words. And you need to output the words and their frequencies. So you don't have to worry about duplicating output results. So this is going to be a string. I'm going to have to split it into a list. I'm then going to have to go through that list and figure out what the frequency is in that list of that word. And that's where that little count function comes in. So, um, here we go. This one looks pretty short, and that's because it is. I'm going to input a value, I'm going to split it, and then I'm going to um, basically use the for and in convention, and I'm going to say user sentence of index and the count of the user sentence plus index. So look at look back and look at how to use the count function on a list. And it really is that simple. There's just not a lot to that one. Okay, 6.19, this is a little more complex. So for 6.19, we're going to replace words. So we're going to replace words in a sentence, so it's going to begin with the word replacement pairs, so the original word and the replacement. Sounds like a dictionary to me. And then you're going to, um, the next line of input is the sentence where the word on the original list is replaced. So I'm going to get two, two inputs. I'm going to get an input with automobile and car, maker and manufacturer, children and kids. And then I'm going to have, they're going to second input, so there's going to be two inputs in this one. Then I'm going to be getting the automobile manufacturer recommends the car seats, blah, blah, blah. And I want to turn that into just the car maker where it had automobile, I'm replacing with car, recommends car seats for kids, kids and children, I'm sorry, maker, manufacturer gets replaced with maker, children gets replaced with kids. So that's what you're doing. So when we go here, basically you're going to have two input statements. Well, I'm going to create a word pair, which is an empty dictionary. I'm going to input my word pairs. I'm also going to input my sentence. I'm going to split those word pairs into a list, and then I'm going to go index from range zero to length, incrementing by two, and I'm going to set those up in a dictionary. So word pairs is an empty dictionary. I'm going to set word pairs of token at index equals token of index plus one. So you're going through the list of all those words but you're going every other. So make sure that you don't go every one because you won't, you won't do the key value pair. The way you do the key value pair is you increment by two. And you go element zero, element of one. So element of zero is the key, element of one is the value. And I may have something similar to this in a script that we can go through. So here's where I'm going to get the user sentence. And then I'm just going to go out and do a replace. So I'm going to do a for loop, and the for loop is over a dictionary. I'm going to have the original word and the new word in word pairs, which is a dictionary, dot items. Then I'm going to set the user center sentence equal replace the original word with the new word in the user sentence. So you're going to have a replace, the string replace, which we have done in the past in um, module two. And then you're going to output the sentence. So those are the labs. And let's see what I have for the move between rooms. Um, let's see. OK, so dictionary.py. So this is an example of what a game might look like. Okay, and this is relevant to what you're going to have to turn in this week. 
and what you're going to have to turn in for your game. Okay, so what do I have here? Let's do a little teeny bit of code review. I have what I, um, I have a dictionary called Rooms. The dictionary called Rooms is a dictionary of dictionaries. So Room 1 has a direction which is up and another room which is Room 2. Room 2 has a direction which is down, um, which is the key, and the value is room 1. And then I have right, which is room 3. And then if I have room 3, I will have left to room 2. So that's how we're dealing with the key value pairs here in this particular replica of what might be a game. And then I have a list of directions. I have up, down, right, and left. So this is, these are the directions, the only directions that are valid. And this is what I can do with that direction because if I have room one, which would be the room I'm in, I can check to see if it has the direction that I put in. If it doesn't, it's invalid. If it does, then I set my new current room to the room from that direction. So let's see how this works. Then I just have like this little set of instructions that you might want to think about for your game because it will make your life easier. And then I have in room. So this is basically what's happening when I'm in a room and what I can do when I'm in a room. And then I just have this little while loop. I've said before, while loop will be used as your gameplay loop. A for loop won't work for this. So I have a current room. Concept of the current room. Where am I? I'm in a room. Well, in this case, I'm in room one. Maybe in yours, you're in the kitchen. Or you're in the dungeon. Or you're on the holodeck or whatever. But it's wherever you, you or your character is in this game at that moment. I have the sentinel uh, value. I have a sentinel value of Q. I have my introductory variable. So it's go. So as long as stop is not Q, then I keep going. And here I'm going to do input. I'm going to print the instructions with the current room. I'm going to print out my instructions. And then I'm going to basically say, okay, it's not Q, so I'm okay. And if my input is not in my directions, so if I put in, you know, ABC, it's not going to be in this directions, then I have an invalid move, and I'm going to continue back up to the loop. So it's all stuff we learned in Module 4. And then if not, then I'm going to say if my current room is room 1, then I'm going to do in room, room 1, and then user input. Now there's actually a quicker way to do this, but for now this will work. So let's run this, if you guys have the time, let's run this through the debugger. I'm just going to assume everybody has the time. Uh, stop that. Sorry about that. Um, why is my do not disturb not on? It should have been on. Anyway. Anyway, I'll stop that. Okay, so I'm here. I haven't, these are all functions and this is, these are two global structures and two functions. So this line 28 is my first executable line of code. And, but I chose to stop on 29. So current room is room 1. If I look at my variables, I have current room is room 1. I have my directions. And then I have my dictionary. So I'm going to now print out my instructions, given the room that I'm in. You are currently in room 1. You can move between rooms using the following instructions, up, down, right, left, to stop, enter, Q. Oh. I have a none there. That's my bad. I have to I have to fix that. I've had it there forever 
and I just haven't <laughs> fixed it. I apologize. I will. Um, so now what am I going to do? So I'm going to type A, B, C, D, E. So my input is A, B, C, D, E. And I'm going to say, is A, B, C, D, E in directions? Because it wasn't Q. Well, it's not in directions. So I'm going to say A, B, C is not valid. And I'm going to continue. I'm up at the top of the loop. I know I'm still in room one. I'm going to print the instructions with the bad none on it. And now it's waiting for input. So I'm going to input uh, up. So let's see what happens when I put in up. So user input not in directions. Well, up is in the directions. So I'm in room one. So I'm going to say current. the new current room is going to be what happens with up and room one. Well, let's go in and take a look. This is a step into function. It is how you get into the code of a function. So I have room one and up. Let's go back and just take a look. Room one does have an up direction. So how, what do I do? So where to is rooms of room. Because what I need to do right now is I need to get the dictionary associated with room one. That's what I am. That's what where to is. Where to is the dictionary that is that I've associated with the word room one in my dictionary of dictionaries. So now I can say if direct is not in where to, I would print invalid, but it is. So I am now going to change rooms to room two. I'm going to pass that back. So room two is being passed back. And current room now becomes room two. So this is how you change rooms in your game using the direction that the user gave you. So this is a good place to start when you're starting to write your game or for module six when you're doing the dragging game that's going to be required. So does anybody have any questions? I'm assuming no. So I'm going to say going once, going twice, Okay, I will uh, hopefully see everybody next week. This should be up on the YouTube channel tomorrow. And everybody have a good evening. I'm going to stop recording and stop sharing.